afternoon and welcome to today's Spotlight series on using digital assessments in the form of essays and literature reviews. My name is Katrina Nihay and I'm going to introduce you to three speakers today. We have Dr. Brendan O'Connell from the School of English, Dr. Jacqueline Hayden from the Department of Political Science and Dr. Nicholas Johnson from the Department of Drama. And they're going to share their experiences of digital assessment in the form of essays with you for this afternoon. After that, we'll have a whole group discussion on the opportunities and challenges that are afforded by digital assessment. Finally, we'll outline some of the digital assessment resources that we've developed within academic practice. But first of all, I'm going to give you an introduction as to why we're here today. So what is the Digital by Design project? This is where it's all stemmed from. This is a project that is funded by the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning. And um, as you can see on the left, we have a Digital by Design web page where we have information about it. And the project is about building digital capacity with, for education within Trinity College, you know, building and supporting it. And to date, we've done a lot of research into what are the digital practices that work and don't work. And um, uh, we, um, we have uh, develop, divide, developed three reports on uh, a, the three different faculties, the AHSS, the STEM and the Health Sciences. Um, in that we looked at across comparable universities across Ireland, the UK, Europe, and the USA and, and worldwide. And those three reports are currently being copy edited and will be up on our website shortly. Also another outcome we've, we've done so far is we've developed these academic practice hubs. And these are three different hubs, one for each, the AHSS, one for STEM, and one for the health sciences. And in, each of these, we have put some resources, for example, we've the outcomes of the um, teaching, learning and assessment survey, which I'll talk to about in, uh, in a minute later, that was carried out last year. We have some um, specific discipline specific uh, resources there. And also we have things like uh, advertisement for this event. So maybe after this event, you could, um, it would be great if you could um, have a look at them and, 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 and see what's in there. But what we want to use them for is to develop communities of practice. So in other words, to places where we can share our expertise, our experiences on uh, using digital technologies or any other um, um, practices within our teaching and learning. Um, so another outcome of the Digital by Design project is to um, run professional development events such as this um, and to develop resources. So at the moment, these are kind of pilot events. We're piloting this to see how, how it will work. And the resources, of course, will be pilots as well. So this particular one here is using, as I said, using digital technologies to enhance assessments. And the idea is at the end of this session, you'll have a set of strategies that support the design or the redesign of an essay or literature review that uses digital technologies to enhance um, the assessment. So um, uh, with that, I'm going to move on here and um, talk about the TLA survey. So this is the teaching, learning and assessment survey that was run by Trinity Teaching and Learning in um, yeah, I think it was May, June last year. So academic practice uh, sent out the survey and we compiled all the results. And the full report of the survey is available on the Trinity Teaching and Learning website. Um, it's only for use in-house. Um, it's only for Trinity academic staff and students uh, to view. So we had, as a result of the survey, which some of you may have participated in, we had um, over, uh, I think it was over about two and a half or 3,000 students responded and or even more in some cases uh, students, maybe it was 4,000 students and we had about four or 500 staff who responded. So um, what we found um, 
in terms of what they were asked about was their experience of digital technologies during COVID. And um, we have a large amount of data on what was used and what wasn't used. So what type of um, uh, technologies were used in like recorded classrooms, discussion boards, uh, and so on. And in particular then, because we're talking about assessments today, what I want to present to you is just the outcomes in terms of essays. So it turns out that 90% of the AHSS students had experienced essays. And the next largest type of assessment they had used was projects with 60% of them. All of the students found that essay worked effectively during COVID. In contrast, then in STEM, only 54% of the students experienced essays. And the largest that they had really was uh, quizzes, tests, quizzes and NCQ and 85% of students experienced them. And for the STEM students of those who had experienced essays, 88% of them found them effective. Um, in the health sciences, 72% of students experienced essays. And again, tests, quizzes and MCQs was the highest percentage of, of something ex assessment experienced by, by health science students. Um, and again, 89% of students who experienced essays found them effective. So we can see here that by and large, a lot of students experienced essays throughout Trinity during COVID. And also most of them found them effective. Uh, in general, then, students' comments suggested that the use of digital technologies, both for teaching and for assessment, was more successful when it was underpinned by digital pedagogies. Um, so in other words, students, you know, found things like, for example, discussion forums useful when there was regular feedback on them and when they were um, perhaps graded uh, and when they had a particular purpose. So the students themselves had identified that, you know, there are digital, digital pedagogies required um, in order to um, use technology in teaching and learning. Um, so just before we go on, I just wanted to, to do this uh, here. If I just like to ask everyone here. So we have 27 participants here at the moment. So a lot of you will have used essays or may not have used essays during your um, uh, um, during COVID, but I'd like you to, to do this is just type into the chat there and just wait a while until people have typed in. And when I say go, send your response to the following question. Did you use digital or online version of an essay assignment during COVID? And if you did, Give one reason why using digital may have enhanced or diminished the efficacy of the assessment essays as an assessment. And if not, how did you replace your essay assignments if you have essay assignments? So I'm just going to give you a minute here now to type in your responses and then we'll press the, the share button. Can I ask a really naive question? Yes. What do you mean by a digital or online version of an essay assessment? It's not, it's a very good question. I suppose the idea is that if it was uh, non-digital, it would be handwritten or maybe typed up at the very least and handed in uh, physically as opposed to online or digitally. I see, thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm going to say go. If everyone would like to return now and send in your responses to the questions. So a lot of people, yes, they did do digital assessment. Um, it enhances work into the deadline, I see. Um, it's diminished by surfing to surface engagement in some ways. These are great to get your uh, answers on these. Um, 
Thank you very much. Online, uh, not but sure what you mean. Students completed the essay and submitted through Blackboard. Feedback was online. Yeah, that's online. Thanks, Catherine. Um, they're great responses. Um, a lot of people did use essays, uh, and some of them, some people reckon they enhanced the efficacy. Um, and the recorded brainstorming exercises. So there were some great things there you, you did during um, COVID, and that's great to hear them. Um, okay, and I see Johnny there has put it in response around digital if you want to read as well. So um, we're going to move on now, and I'm going to present our first guest, which is um, Brendan O'Connell. Um, Okay, um, and I'm going to stop sharing here so Brendan can start there. Okay, Brendan. Thanks very much, Katrina. Thanks very much. I'm just going to give me a second there just to um, pop that up on the screen. Um, and I Okay, hopefully you can all uh, see that there. Uh, thanks very much, Katrina, for inviting me along today. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining. So today I'm going to be uh, speaking uh, to you all about our school's experience of incorporating digital assessments as part of our, our capstone project. Some of you might already be familiar with this if you're if you're in the school, but hopefully some of these ideas are, are relevant more broadly to the um, discussion today. So a few years ago, our school introduced or decided to, to really develop a couple of alternatives for the capstone familiar with to some extent. So we brought in a creative writing uh, capstone project and we also brought in an open collections capstone project one I want to um, talk to you about today. So the latter was really designed as an alternative to the traditional dissertation of 10 to 12,000 words, and it encourages engagement with the library's collections in early printed books and in manuscripts and archives. At the start of the project, I suppose interested staff were asked to identify appropriate materials from those collections in the library uh, that students might be interested in, in researching. The current list covers everything really for a range of things from medieval and Renaissance texts to the works of Mariah Edgeworth and, and Bram Stoker uh, to projects that engage with the Pollard's collection of, of children's books. Um, a whole separate, module, I suppose, in SITS and in Blackboard had to be set up for this model of the, the capstone, uh, uh, and it had a distinctive assessment pattern and learning outcomes. So the assessment pattern, uh, which was, and this was all discussed by the school and agreed kind of collectively uh, by, uh, by all of us, uh, would, would include a kind of a reflective journal, which was 20% of the mark, an analytical essay that was worth 40%, and then a what was called a public facing element, uh, which would usually be a blog, but it can be something else. You could use this for like an online exhibition or a podcast or, or something like that, but it's usually um, a blog and that was worth 40%. These different elements uh, assess various different learning outcomes, including that students should be able to conduct original archival research, create public facing digital outputs, engage in critical thinking and communicate academic insights to the uh, general public. Just to give uh, you all a sense of, of what was involved and in all of the the kind of, I suppose, technologies that the school decided to use uh, and the teaching uh, supports that we had to put in place to kind of support all of this. Um, a, a range of digital technologies were are used, were used and are used to support the assessments. The analytical essay is, uh, you know, as a number of you have already kind of mentioned in your comments there, it's just a, a st this is just the standard type of, of online submission of essays via Blackboard that, that I'm sure we're all familiar with. At this stage after after COVID. The reflective journal is maybe a more interesting uh, kind of a element here because that was originally conceived as a, a, a physical uh, handwritten journal where we were going to ask students to, um, to, to kind of 
present, uh, their submit their, their handwritten notes uh, reflecting on their experience working with the project and their experience developing the blog or whatever, um, whatever it, it was. It's a good idea because I think it makes the students think about the kind of process of knowledge production and also to think about the medium in which the findings of re research could be presented. And a couple of years ago, I, I, I supervised a student doing this project and, and she incorporated a kind of a scanned image of one of her journal, um, her journal entries into her blog as a way of kind of comparing and contrasting the, uh, the kind of organizational features of a medieval manuscript, which is what she was looking at with her own kind of journal as a kind of 21st century manuscript in, in a way. The public facing element is usually a blog, like I say, though you can do uh, you can do other things, um, particularly if if uh, uh, if you're involved in in some other kind of digital research project that you might be able to connect with. But when we use the the blog, the the format we use is just WordPress, which works quite well for us because it uh, it's quite easily available. It it allows us to kind of password protect the students password protect the work so that they can be developing it in the background and then they don't have to make anything public until they've got their marks and everything is uh, has been checked for say copyright compliance and 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 all of that. So that worked uh, quite well um, for us. Now, the different skills involved in something like this uh, require different kind of teaching supports. So, so things like developing guidelines and, and feedback on the, the essay, um, marking criteria, all of that stuff, um, providing students with links to YouTube tutorials. Um, we we um, all colleagues were asked to kind of submit sample blogs that they thought were kind of good examples for students of, of, of a kind of digital uh, projects for the public facing element and also things like group training sessions that were uh, kind of introduced to support all of this. So actually quite a lot of, of, of work has to go into that kind of side of supporting things, I think. Now, obviously a model like this has a lot of challenges. So some of the challenges were things like ensuring that appropriate guidance and developing the grading schemes and all of those other, other things. Another issue was just defining what you mean by public facing elements. So uh, students were encouraged to kind of think about their audience and kind of include that in their, their journals. And, and then that was taken into consideration when, when marking the, the blogs and the public facing elements. And also copyright issues had to be addressed by liaising with the library, uh, encouraging the use of, of already digitized material, uh, providing guidance on requests for permissions, et cetera, and the password protection, like I mentioned. But there's also lots of other uh, opportunities, including supporting students to engage with archival research, developing transferable skills in archives, digital public engagement and all of that, and connecting the school's uh, goals with the goals of the library and, uh, and college. All in all, I think a lot of opportunities as well as, as challenges, and I know that a lot of students and staff have, have benefited a lot from being involved. So that's, that's me, that's all I have to say for now, but happy to chat more later. Thank you very much, Brendan. That was excellent. A really um, wonderful um, project there. Uh, really enjoyed it. We can give him a, a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brendan. OK, uh, we'll move on next then. I think it's Jacqueline is coming up next. If you want to start sharing your screen there, Jacqueline, that would be great. I'll unmute myself first um, and I will share my screen. And where are my slides? Uh, my sharing screen. Sorry, just get me the slides there now. Can people see that there now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, you can. Yeah. Thanks. Um, first of all, my name's Jack Hayden, and I work in the Department of Political Science. And um, just a little bit of way by way by way of background I was a journalist uh, for a long time and I came into academia late and it has impacted kind of how I think about um, teaching and learning I was a, a an on-air um, television and radio reporter and producer so what I'm going to talk to you about today is a a, a program called or a module called personal career development that we ran as a pilot in the Department of Political Science just going into COVID. So even if I had 
never uh, planned to have it hybrid, it, it ended up being hybrid. So it, as you can see, it was, I had great support from Aura Dwyer and Career Advisory Services, and it was a joint project between us. And I suppose the, the main thing to be said about uh, the personal career de development um, module was that we were trying to get away completely from traditional assessment um, exam and essay writing. And the reason for that was simply that our main aim was the embedding of transferable skills. And one of the observations that sort of was behind um, the generation of this kind of module was that we have politics, uh, there's so many combinations with political science. Um, and so you've got Paul Jog, his, you know, his Paul, Law Paul, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the aims was to sort of uh, really encourage interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary thinking, getting people out, out of silos. So it was very much aimed at transferable skills, emphasizing also, you know, uh, communication and present, uh, presentation skills. Um, teamwork was a really major aim um, that we, we 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 had in mind when we were developing this one and sorry i've just gone i want to go back to where i was peer uh, peer and self assessment you know the ability to be construct constructively criticize the work of others but you know that that would would, would wouldn't endanger uh, relationships within a workspace a very important aim of this module was um, that people would come out of it with a career portfolio, an action plan, and, and important things like um, have, you know, having tried to do things like um, to develop a, a personal video. And we also did a lot, a lot of stuff on resi resilience. So that was the, the background and the aims. But I, I want to just talk about one of the things that we did. Um, and, and Katrina, I, I would have talked about more, but Katrina pointed out it was better to explain one thing better than to try and explain too, uh, too much. Um, one of the tasks we did, and this involved uh, podcasting and then peer review, was to uh, bring students to room 3131, which is where I work, at four o'clock and give them a workplace problem a scenario in this case it was a a, a human resource a human um it was a kind of a human resources hr issue it was about bullying and it was um, we gave them very specific uh, scenarios uh, of what had happened three allegations um of serious bullying uh, in the context of uh, this being a conference center where on the next day there was going to be the big prize conference of the year that was very important to this particular um, management team. So students are divided into groups of three or four. They're allocated this problem. They only get it on the day. They get the sheet. Um, and as I said, it's, a, it's an incidence of serious bullying. And they're, they're, go, they're given 60 minutes, uh, basically to go to the library or wherever, and to work out potential solutions to that problem, mindful of the fact that there is a, a set of asks from the senior management person who says, look, this has happened. We need to react to this on X, Y and Z level. So students go off and their instruction is to um, formulate a five minute presentation. They're divided into groups of three or four and they're going to come back to room 3131 um, within the hour, they're given 60 minutes, and they are then um, allocated their five minutes, which is podcast. The decisions they have to make, uh, of course, is do they all present? Do they nominate somebody to present on behalf of the team? How do they co coordinate all of the work between them so they have to task share you know um, and they're given three uh, they were given three um, key things to do that they needed to have an immediate response from the management team how did they actually go and talk to the people who were in distress so what was the immediate plan of action there what was the long-term plan of action how how did they deal with the various issues that arise in the context of 
uh, you know, legal considerations, HR considerations, duty of care, all of that. And then the task, which perhaps the money-minded managers would have been, been most concerned about is how do you prevent that incident um, basically upsetting the apple cart, you know, how to keep the show on the road for the, for the actual big event that's happening the next day. Now, it, it, my experience, of, it was with a group of about um, 25 to 26 students, so we had about five presentations. Um, and each, firstly, each and every one of them came back and did presentations, which were, in my view, um, exceptionally good. It, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, no, no, nobody found it out. People took different kinds of decisions, but the, the important thing um, was that we used then um, the presentations in the next step to, they, they peer reviewed them themselves. They assessed their own performance. They discussed their own performance. And what I was evaluating and, and, and the, the, the other um, people involved with me were evaluating was issues like that they're the understanding, you know, the issues and challenges that were facing the management team. That's obviously trying to bring together a, a lot of interdisciplinary skills. Um, and so I was assessing to the extent to which they understood the problem and the multiplicity of problems that would arise, as I said, HR, legal, duty of care, many others, um, and how they would assimilate that and, and express it in terms of their presentation. So that was one part. Also, obviously, the clarity and comprehend comprehensiveness of the solutions that they offered. We, 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 we evaluated that. And then their pure presentation and communication skills. But importantly, and we made this, we really tried to get it clear to them that what we were also looking at was how they, how they managed as a team. How did they divide up the work? How did they, did they, did they actually get the best out of each other? Did they acknowledge who was good at what? So coordination um, skills. Um, and then, as I said, in, as part of, of this, because it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a one semester module. So there were, were many other exercises like this um, that we used, but in terms of the teaching and learning and the outcomes, um, I, I think that the, the, the use of the podcast the, the, the use of the podcast, not just for the evaluation for, from our end, but the fact that they had to perform um, very quickly under pressure of time. In other words, they had to do analysis on the hop. They had to think in an interdisciplinary fashion. They had to, they couldn't just say, oh, well, the legal, the, the lawyers amongst them couldn't just say, well, the legal answer, because obviously that was something that required a lot of um, it, it, as I said, interdisciplinary thinking. And um, I interrupt you there, Jacqueline. Yeah. We're kind of gone yeah. a little bit over time. And so maybe if we could finish up there, that would be great. Yeah, I would just, I, yeah, I would just, yeah, I would, I would just say that the, the big thing that I got, uh, I think that the students got out of it was constructive criticism. The fact that they were able to peer review each other, the fact that they um, understood the use of the, you know, they really learned how to use those technologies effectively. And they got by reference to what they said, they gave me in their feedback, they, they got an awful lot uh, out of the um, experience. And as I said, there was, we used other, other scenarios like that. So thank you, sorry for going over. No problem. Thanks, Jacqueline. That was very interesting. I had read your actually brief for that as well um, beforehand. So it is, uh, looks like a very good and interesting assessment for the students. Um, we'll move on then to our next speaker, Nicholas um, Johnson from the Department of Drama. Um, do you want to share your screen or do you want me to share those slides you sent? Um, I'll, I'll, share, uh, I'll share on my end. I have one little update to those that I sent previously, so it should be just right. Right. Um, and thanks, Jack, as well. Great to see you. Great to see you again. Um, okay, so uh, just to, I'll, I'll start a timer here just so I can kind of stay, uh, stay close to time. Um, the module that I wanted to discuss from drama uh, in terms of digital assessment was uh, our module Theatre History 2, which uh, is a uh, open module that runs twice uh, for 40 students. 
it's a requirement for drama students, but we also take 20 students per class from other disciplines, and it runs in each term uh, the same module twice to provide flexibility for students in their second year. Um, so the case study is only one of the assessments that this class has. Um, I, I wanted to offer the kind of basic module aims. You can see uh, how we handle student workload. Uh, it's two lectures per week plus a seminar for each student. Small group seminars, we have three groups, so maybe 10, 15 students. Um, we assign uh, two to three readings per week, expecting you know five to six hours of student input per week. And we survey uh, the 20th and early 21st centuries uh, in terms of European theater. Uh, in social, philosophical, and political contexts. And we go through kind of modernism up to reading week, and then we look at postmodern dramaturgy, contemporary theater uh, after that. The um, learning outcomes that we think about um, are listed here. And I think the one that I would point out um, is this very last one, which is really what the two assessments target. It's the ability to argue aesthetic positions cogently in both written and oral formats. So we, we prompt them with a series of possible questions. And what they do is a short essay um, of uh, about a thousand words in week seven. They submit that for reading week. Uh, they get assessment then before they do an oral presentation, which is equally weighted at 40% in week 12. And then we assess their continuous engagement, which is a blend of assessment as well as in class and then their online activity uh, contributions to the class knowledge base, to the course Padlet and these other spaces. So um, we have as a working method, uh, weekly lectures, conversation, and then gradually over the course of the pandemic, uh, enhancing greatly the kind of digital environment, you know, both on Blackboard and using Padlet as a key center for uh, engagement for students. So I'm gonna zoom in on the short essay assignment and uh, just take you through what we do there. So um, I've taken a screenshot from the Blackboard and the assessments section of Blackboard where just for this first assessment, um, the assignment is called a modernist remix. What we do is we ask them to take a system for modernism, one of the isms of the avant-garde's, and a source from a different system and imagine a performance uh, of these two. So they, they take one system like naturalism and smash it against a surrealist text or vice versa, which sort of forces them to understand two movements or two different ways. Um, we then give them uh, a, a, a whole bunch of resource. So we give them a flowchart that helps them pick uh, the topic, the voice. We've started to use that to head off the main errors. So what students have done in the past, um, we've kind of synthesized what problems they run into. And we've given them a flowchart that says, you know, if you haven't picked a voice, here's how to do that and try to create, you know, a, a resource for the main issues. We give them the assessment rubric well in advance, a digital template for how to format their submission. This is particularly important for open module students because they don't have the training that our students in drama would have in terms of our expectations for citation or writing or formatting. And so we can head off a lot of the presentation issues just by being very clear, you know, giving a kind of doc template that, that has that. And then we focus instead on the thinking and on the writing and less on the cosmetics. Um, we give them all of the first year uh, module study skills material within this module. They can access their first year module materials. Um, to go back and, and remember things that we taught them about citation or essay writing. And then recently, just this year, we've started adding seminar worksheets that capture their discussion, and then they still have the online submission portal. So what I would describe this as in terms of intervention is that um, Blackboard ceases to be just a repository of a syllabus and PDFs of readings. It turns into kind of a dynamic working space that has uh, you know, in and out uh, data. The students can include, and our material itself has become much more uh, multimedia enriched. It's really important for us to use um, Padlet and that uh, the, the multimedia affordances and smooth interface of Padlet, the comment function is much better than the discussion board facility available within Blackboard. So we use that extensively now across all our modules. Uh, faculty comment, they engage regularly. It's interactive with students. We now make all lectures available as recordings. Um, so there's an archive of what happens in the classroom. Students can continue to access. And then the feedback um, we've diversified. It's not just a general comment, but it's using all of Grademark's capabilities. So rubrics, uh, which speeds us way up, we do those first. And then we add in quick marks for the grammar and citation issues. And then general comments, which we type and share between the TAs and, the, and me and then voice comments occasionally when something is really excellent or really weak, we often record a voice comment to try to enhance the kind of office uh, office hours feel of that. 
So for discussion um, in the discussion, we, this was not new to us. We, we, didn't, we didn't have paper submissions for the last 10 years. Um, so a lot of people have been using Turnitin and Grademark. But the pandemic era, what we noticed is that with all these extra teaching scaffoldings and the digitization of the development of the essay, all the connection with students in advance has led to much stronger work. Um, so we've seen an, an increase and an improvement in second year level writing as a consequence of this. Um, and then our other question, which is, is for another session perhaps, is how this could extend to other forms of assessment. This also has presentations in the module. We, during the pandemic, had to innovate a lot of things with performance and project-based work. And we think that some of what we've learned through this module um, could be applied to some of our other modules and other types of assessments. So um, I just wanna thank uh, you all for the opportunity to share that with you. And uh, I'm eager to discuss more if anybody would like to, to hear more uh, in the discussion forum. And thank you to Academic Practice for the invitation. Okay, thank you very much, Nicholas.